Tonight's message is entitled, A Relationship That Stands the Test of Time. Father, right now, again, I want to just ask for your presence here. Lord, I am a willing servant. Sometimes stumbles and bumbles my words together, but Lord, you know my heart. Tonight, I just want to lift up Jesus. I want Jesus to be seen tonight in all we say and do, we pray. Amen. I took this picture with my phone just a few days before we came up here. And it's time, you can see it's, it's still, that, that picture of my school life in 1958-59 is still, it's got a plastic wrap on it. And it's time to confess the ugly truth. If there was a gathering of my fourth grade class, now that's actually grades four through eight in that picture. No, I take that back. That's the whole school. Uh, there was two rooms. That's the whole school in Springfield, Massachusetts. If we were to gather that fourth grade class together, are you ready for this? We'd be celebrating my 65th year that I've not seen that, though any of them. Well, I've seen one or two of them. Now, I don't know if this thing even has a pointer on it, does it? Yeah, okay, just, just so you kind of want to squint. There's me right there. <laughs> and my brother uh, that was here the other night is right here, Rudy. And Lonnie is um, right there. And my other brother, Dallas, is down here. And my brother Eugene is right there. So all five of us were in that class. So we, we were, what, 25% of the school? <laughs> anyway, I have absolutely no photos of grades one, two, and three when we were in the farmland up in Saskatchewan, Canada. We moved, we moved to Springfield, Massachusetts. My dad was a farmer teacher in Saskatchewan. He had he gone through a very difficult time. Um, his dream of dreams was to sing bass with the well-known radio broadcast called The Voice of Prophecy with HMS Richards. They were his hero. And when one of the basses announced that he was going to re retire or resign, they interviewed my dad. My dad got the job. He... Um, he moved the family from Saskatchewan to Glendale, California, and that was in the days when everything was live. And so Sunday, 6 o'clock Sunday morning, they were going down to the Mutual Studios, for the East Coast feed. 9 o'clock, they'd be back for the West Coast feed. He went to camp meetings with the King's Heralds and HMS, and it was just the dream come true. And then the enemy... Gave him a haymaker. Only a little more than a year into that wonderful experience, he started developing a problem with his throat. And he had it examined. Wouldn't you know he had a cancerous growth in his voice box? And the doctors told him, you may never talk or sing again. What? Surgery needs to be done immediately. So we had that surgery done for the next six months. He had to write anything he wanted to communicate with my mom. He had to write notes back and forth. And he went from the pinnacle to the pit. He was so discouraged. I mean, Lord, why are you doing this to me? Well, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, is his voice came back stronger than ever, ever. And, you know, he, when he, there at Glendale, he said, I'm moving, I'm taking my, my five boys back to the farm up in Saskatchewan. I'll have five hired hands that I won't have to pay for. I'll just start farming and teaching. But it was in 1957 that the Lord grabbed my dad again and called him into ministry. And we moved back to Massachusetts. Didn't know a soul. Now, there's a couple of young people here tonight. You know, 
That wasn't the Stone Age, but probably close to it. <laughs> and about the only thing I remember from, from fourth grade was that Miss Kidder was her name. She was a 75-year-old teacher, or close to 80. She demanded that after lunch, we would have to take a nap. We had to put our heads down on the desk to take a nap. After lunch. <sighs> Tell you what, my attitude about that has changed, too. <laughs> I can dream that someone would force me to take a nap. The only other, picture, the only other person in this picture that I recognize, this guy right here was my friend, my best friend. His name was Bobby. But the rest of those people, I mean, I can maybe remember their names. But... They're just memories is all they are. Oh, yeah, I guess I remember some of the names. But most of those people, we have not, our paths have not crossed in 65 years. Can any of you relate to what I'm sharing with you? Of course you can. As my memory has faded, unfortunately, so have a lot of relationships. And um, relationships that were once treasured, I'd love to find out where Bobby is, Bobby Marshall. Relationships once treasured, now there's the faded memory of the past. Now here's a picture of my sixth grade class, and I can identify maybe two people. That's the only, that's the only memory I have of that. Now here's a real oldie. So here's a copy of the newspaper photo of my entire senior class, graduating class from Loma Linda Academy in 1966, 77 seniors. I've remained, I've remained in contact with just a handful. And I know of at least 18 or 20 that have passed away. My best friend in high school disappeared after serving in Vietnam, came back home, a druggie, he had just messed up his life. No one knows where he is. You haven't seen him in 50 years. It just kind of gets to you, doesn't it? Well, when I went to my 50th high school reunion a few years ago, it was like going into an old folks home. I was surrounded by a bunch of old people. Another memory started coming back. I pulled this picture out. I used to sing in a quartet there at La Sierra College when I was there. Music has always been a part of my, my life. There's my brother Lonnie and a couple of the good friends. We had this quartet, did a lot of fun stuff together. Now, this is, this is a very poor picture, but this is the best day of my life. 52 years ago, last August, best day of my life. Judy Slusarenko married Jody Meloshenko. So we are pure Ukrainians. Our kids are undefiled. They have pure Ukrainian blood. And then, yes, this is me, my, one of my first jobs as an elementary school teacher. Long hair and all. Sitting behind the teacher's desk looking so professional. Then our first little daughter came along. Joanne, she's about three years old then. And then I was invited to do youth ministries. We served in the islands of Hawaii and so... We had this crazy Christmas picture there at the beach. And I, and I just love remembering these wonderful times as a family. You know, over in Hawaii, they do the shaka thing. So there they are, my boys and my daughter. While we were there, I did an evangelistic series with my, my brother Lonnie over in Russia. We went back to our homeland and I came back with all these Russian coats and military garb. And so we had a lot of fun posing with, with the family. Memories, ways to remember the past. You met Lonnie and Jeannie here this last week, singing and doing ministry with the family. And then a few years ago, before my mom and dad passed, we took them back to the old homestead there up in Saskatchewan. But friends, just like the wind, the years have flown by much too quickly. And all we have is memories. I don't know what we do without them. Judy and I, we love sitting and looking at the old photo. We still have old photo albums. I'm sure some of you too. 
thanks for letting me go down memory's lane for a few minutes tonight, but I'm doing it for a reason. You see, the truth is, without spending special time with people that we love, those close relationships will eventually slip away. The point of all this is that God knew the danger of fading relationships. To keep friendships going, you have to maintain a connection. I mean, that's the only way that people, you know, sadly, a good friend of mine, his wife just said, I'm, I'm done. No connection anymore. We, we live in the same house. We, you know, we eat at the same table, but the relationship. But you know, that reality is especially true of our relationship between our creator and the created. God to man. And also our personal, our one-on-one -on -one time with him as our friend and our redeemer. It's a challenge. It just doesn't happen. You have to be intentional about it. Our God knew the importance of memorials as reminders of meaningful relationships. Man, I wish I'd have kept pictures and addresses of some of those old chums of mine just to be intentional. I mean, you know, if I knew then what I know now, you know that whole story. But I probably have maintained some of those relationships in a much more active way. Well, even our government, they see the importance of memorials, of remembering. Because we, memorials remind us where we came from. And now we've become who we are today. Memorials. They're all around us. We're all, all around our nation. I love going to Mount Rushmore and Lincoln Memorial. And watching, watching that great, incredible brass statue of Iwo Jima. These memorials keep fresh in our memories those who have gone before us, those who paid the ultimate price for our freedom. Visited the Vietnam Wall in Washington, D.C. a few years ago, and I started crying. I started bawling because there I saw the names of a couple of my good buddies in high school. Memorials, remembrances. Knowing this is very important as God created us. See, God provided a way for us to spend quality time with him. My wife and I, we, we've come to realize at this stage in our journey, there are times we just are in the same room together, but our, you know, we may be, she'll say something and it's the same thought I'm, th I'm, I, I'm thinking. But we've been intentional. Okay, so it's either every Tuesday or Wednesday, it's, we're going to go out on a date. I know that's not the term they use these days, but whatever. We go out on a date. We go do something together. And it's an intentional way to get close to each other. A close connection with each other. Now, history has proven that when God's children have strayed from his relationship plan, they eventually begin to forget. They begin to forget where they came from and why they even exist. Unfortunately, many of them end up not believing that he even exists at all because that relationship is gone. Without this picture here as a memorial, I wouldn't have remembered many of these, these people by name. I don't remember their faces. They'd be forgotten. Friends, it's the same way with God. Many have not only lost sight of him as their creator, but they have no idea that they've lost sight of him also as, as provider, as recreator, as their friend, as their redeemer. And sadly, a majority of Christians have forgotten the love-based memorial in time that Jesus, that God himself instituted in the Garden of Eden. The very beginning of man's existence, he wanted to make sure 
that he intentionally gave us an island in time to communicate and spend time with him. This gift that would have made the relationship between God and man a much more meaningful experience. So God placed in the very heart of the Ten Commandments the key to staying connected with him. God told his children, if you love me, in John 14, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you love me. And then in the fourth commandment, he specifically says, no other commandment says it, remember. I'd like to remember the names of all those friends of mine. Sadly, most of our world has forgotten it, that fourth commandment. They've ignored it, they've misunderstood it, or they're simply not even aware of it. I'm going to pause for a minute. It's very important for us to realize how much God really loves each and every one of us individually. This is not just some, you know, mumbo-jumbo, fancy words. No, every one of you are special to God. Every one of you were planned in God's sight before creation. I want you to read this passage for, or together, look at this passage in Ephesians 1. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Do you get that? Before this world was even began, he knew about you. He chose us before the foundation. Your eyes saw my substance, being yet unformed. Ooh, we won't talk about the unborn right now, but that's really what it's saying. Your eyes saw my substance, being yet unformed. And in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I could count them, they are more than the sands of the sea. Psalm 139. Wow. God's thoughts of each of us, as numerous as the sands of the sea? (laughs) I remember as a kid, very first time I went to the beach was at Cape Cod. I'd never been to a beach before when we were in Massachusetts and some friends of ours took us to Cape Cod. And I sat there in the sand and I saw some little tiny shells and stuff. I picked a handful of sand up. And I remember my mom or my dad, they made reference to this passage. After about 10 or 15 grains of sand, I I said, I'm not counting anymore. (laughs) This same God, the one who made you special, oh, how much he desires a special relationship with you. I think probably one of the greatest challenges for me, and I'm just sharing, I'm sharing a little bit of me right now. I don't talk as much to my wife as I should. I I don't, I don't, you know, there's times I'm, you know, think these, I'm thinking we're on the, on the same wavelength. But boy, when we do talk and we do communicate, it's on a whole different level. And that's what God wants for us. Now, let's turn our thoughts back for just a few minutes to the creation week. We talked about that a few nights ago when it all started. You can find the whole story in Genesis 1 and 2, but here in the book of Psalms, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him, for he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Wow. So, to set an example for us of the weekly cycle, God chose to create the world over a literal week. Now, I'm going to just confess with you, friends, call me old school, whatever. I still believe in a very biblical worldview. I believe in the seven days of creation, and I believe in the flood and all the stuff that the Bible talks about. And it's interesting how science keeps 
thinking they're, they're, they're outsmarting the Bible, but discoveries in archaeology keep validating the biblical worldview. But let's move on. So he chose to create this world over a literal week. Now, I know what a day is. It's one revolution of the earth around its axis, 24 hours. I know what a month is. That's the time it takes for the moon to make one loop around the earth. And I know what a year is. Uh, that's the time it takes the earth to make one loop around the sun. But where do we get a seven-day week from? Every nation in the, on the face of the earth, since time began, since their history, they have followed a seven-day week. Guess what? Creation week is the only explanation. So on days one to four, or one to five, in the Garden of Eden, or in, at the beginning of time, he spoke our amazing world into existence. Remember, on day six, and he creates a lot of the animals, but then the most amazing thing happens where he creates Adam and Eve. The most amazing creature that the universe could imagine. And God says, verse, Genesis 1, verses 20, let's make man in our image, according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the animals. And so God created man in his own, in his own image. We discussed a little bit about that the other night, about breathing into that lump of clay, the breath of life, the spirit. And then with eager anticipation of getting to know his new children, God drops to his knees and he forms man of this dust, breathes into the breath of life, and man becomes a living being. His creation is complete. Heavens and earth, the sea, all the host of them were finished. Adam and Eve. The Bible says that God saw everything that he had made, and it was pretty good. It says, no, it was very good. But now would come that crowning act of creating one of the greatest gifts for mankind. Genesis 2. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work which he had done. And then on his holy day, he rests. Not as one who's tired and weary, but one well pleased with what he had done, with the results of his creation. And so after resting on the seventh day, God reveals the character of his heart of love. He did something very special for, this, for his new children. He creates this time that he wants to be, become better acquainted with them. He did something for the seventh day that he did not do for any other day. And I think already you know the, the answer to that. Genesis 2, 3 says, And then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all the work which, which God had created and made. <laughs> sanctified. There's three things in that verse that God did on this special day, he rested on it, he blessed it, and he sanctified it. Now, to sanctify means to set it apart, to make it special. A holy day, a rest for mankind. So here, we see in Genesis, is laid this sacred foundation for each of us to have a special relationship with our Creator, with, with our God. A time to rest upon His holy, sacred, and blessed day. I mean, on this day, a day that we could spend taking time to look upon His handiwork, His creation, 
and the stars, the moon, the sun, a day to look into his incredible creations. My wife and I, we just absolutely fell in love with the islands when we were over there and I'll tell you what, some of our favorite activities. Some of our friends, they liked hiking, going bird watching and hummingbird watching. I mean hummingbirds over there. One of our favorite activities was fish watching. Feeding the fish. And if you've ever put on a snorkel or a scuba gear and gaze, it is a spiritual experience. Literally. So to look and to study upon the, the greatness of God's creation is, is an incredible opportunity. Time to behold the evidences of his love and his wisdom and his benevolence to mankind. All this that our hearts might be filled with love and appreciation and reverence for our creator. That's what the Sabbath's all about. Sabbath was given to all of men and women for eternity. It wasn't just given to them in the garden. Notice this in Isaiah. Everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it, profane it, and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. You get that? Given to everybody. Long before Abraham or the Jewish nation ever existed, the Sabbath was instituted. It was enjoyed by Adam and Eve in the garden. And, in, and it continued from generation to generation by the patriarchs, by the prophets. But sadly, over time, God's people, they took their eyes off of him. And the history of the children of Israel, you can read over and over again, how they struggled, how they backslid, became slaves. I mean, it was... The, their whole history is one of this roller coaster ride. They'd find God, they'd find worship, and sat, and then back into the into the pit. You see, the blessings given to them in Egypt eventually became a curse when they were forced into slavery. So here we have, like many today, the children of Israel, those Hebrews. They became distracted by the cares of life. And today, the enemy, Satan, uses the same strategy to distract us from the sacred time that God has given to us that way too many have forgotten that he is our creator. And you get caught up in busyness. The Bible describes it this way, 1 John 2, 16. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. I think we might assume that when we talk about of the world, the prince of this world, he thinks, is the enemy. You see, this result, purely put, sin is slavery to our jobs, to things that, that we put ahead of God. When the, when the Ten Commandments talk about having no other gods before me, it doesn't have to be a carved, carved out of stone or, or metal or an image. Whatever we put ahead of God, the more important, we become a slave to it. Slavery to entertainment, to our, our devices, to, to lust. How about slavery to social media? I mean, there are thousands of other things that we can look at as the way the, way the enemy is, is distracting us. But God designed the heart of man and women to worship him. And without observing this special memorial each week and honoring him as our creator, we are in the danger zone. We're in danger of losing sight of him just as they did before us. Remember, fourth commandment starts. Remember, 
That means maybe people are going to forget. Unfortunately, that's the case. So the Hebrews, children of Israel, they allowed idolatry to creep in. Are we guilty of the same thing? Something that you put ahead of God? First place instead of him? See, God's heart ached for his children. So he frees them from bondage of slavery in Egypt. And then they end up at Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, he, this is where he, the Ten Commandments are given to the children of Israel. And at Mount Sinai, he reminded them of the blessings of the Sabbath. Now, I don't need to go into, I don't have time tonight, but the children of Israel all knew about the Sabbath when they were out in the wilderness. Because they were a griping bunch. They weren't too content with life. They complained. So God sent them a pillar of cloud by day to keep them cool. And then at night, pillar of fire. But they, have need, they need something to eat. So we know the rest of the story. God rains down manna upon them every morning. It's like little flaky, sweet honeycombs. Before the commandments were given, he told the children of Israel, just gather enough that you need for one day. Eat it. It'll be every day. But on Friday, the preparation day, go out and gather twice as much as you'll need. And it will not spoil, but there'll be none there on the seventh day Sabbath. The children of Israel understood that. They understood the blessing of the Sabbath. So the commandments were handed down to them. The fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You know your son, your daughter, your maidservant, your female servant, your livestock, or the sojourn who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it or made it holy. I learned that in the King James. That commandment, the Sabbath commandment, reminds us, notice what's encased in that commandment. It reminds us of the Creator. Does it not? It says, six days you will ever, and when it, made, when it meant for, in six days the Lord made heaven and earth this year. It's reminding us of the creative power. And it's no secret. Notice where the enemy of souls, churches, schools. There's not one public school in America or in North America that even suggests a literal seven-day creation. If you even dare to suggest that you'll be You'd be looked at as just an absolute imbecile. So the reality is most of our culture, most of our secular culture today has forgotten the creator. You see, men without understanding believe they have forgotten about the creator. They've tried to come up with all kinds of theories of evolution. By the way, I'll pause right now. Charles Darwin, before he died, he recanted all of his writings, the theory of evolution that he came up with. He's actually buried in Westminster Abbey, as, but he realized by that time it was too late. Let me back up again. So God honors, so God blesses, and he makes sacred the seventh day, Sabbath. Well, many people believe that any day is fine, as long as they worship him. 
They say, hey, I can worship God seven days a week. I hope you do. I hope everybody takes time for God seven days a week. I hope you have time in the morning or evening where you spend time with him. That's where you get to know him. So, yes, I can, I can, I can worship God seven days a week. But does it matter to God which day we consider as holy? This didn't happen, but I'm just going to make up a story here. So it's Jody's birthday. And um, we're going to have a birthday party. And Judy forgets it's my birthday. And so she says, oh, one or two days late, it doesn't matter. How would that go over with Janelle there, Jim? <laughs> Does it make a difference? Absolutely. And the fourth commandment is a memorial to him of our creator. We've already mentioned that creator part of it. The Sabbath is a holy and blessed day. And no matter how much you want to convince yourself that any other day of the week can be holy, I have some news for you. Men, women cannot make something holy that God makes holy. Only God has that right to make something holy. When he has his holy touch, sanctify it, he only has the right to do that. And that's what the Sabbath is all about. It's a commemoration of his creative power. And this fact is the fundamental reason why we as his created beings worship him. Why I choose to worship him on the Sabbath. And it is, is it any surprise that this is one of those commandments that the devil attacks so viciously? You see, the, the, the devil knows that if he can get us to forget the, the correct day, then he can get us to, to neglect other facts. He knows that he can get us to neglect the fact that it is a day to be kept holy to the Creator. And so he cleverly seeks to divert our attention away from God to himself. And if you look at the book, book of Revelation, we discover in that book, that worship is one of the main themes at the end of time. Revelation 14, this is the third angel. He said with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of waters. That is a reflection back to the fourth commandment. All of us know what the presidential seal looks like. I took a copy of this. Every official seal has three things. The name, the office, and the territory. And when we look at the fourth commandment, we discover all three of those. Notice the familiar description from the fourth commandment. God's mark, creator. Seal that's found here in this verse. His name is God. He is a creator. His ter territory is heaven and earth and the springs of water. This is the seal of God, the fourth commandment. So this seal reminds us week to week that he is an almighty creator God. And Satan doesn't want us to obey God and set aside our work and, and our, our worldly concerns. We live in a culture right now where everybody is so busy. I got some little grandkids, my two little granddaughters that live in the Phoenix area, 10 and 12 years old. I just love them to death. They are so busy, but they don't have time for Jesus. And the enemy knows that the busier we get, the less likely we are to spend time to develop a relationship with God. Does that make sense? So let's keep going. If God's holy day is the seventh day Sabbath, it's a fact. 
It's been honored throughout history. But if man had, had maintained a relationship with God, if they'd have come to understand and followed the fourth commandment during the history of man, there'd be no, there'd be no atheists, there'd be no agnostics. We would know the purpose of our existence. But here's another point about the, about the fourth commandment. And I say this very sincerely, the seventh day Sabbath is one of the, is one of the greatest blessings that God gave mankind in creation. Actually, there's two incredible blessings that I, want to, that I want to just focus on. And it's very interesting that both of those under vicious attack. The first being marriage in the family. Do I need to get political with you tonight? Male and female created he them. Now our secular word tells us there, there's, as, there's as many as, what is it now, 27 genders and all this kind of nonsense? It's because people have lost focus on the creator. And they're coming up with these theories and stuff that a third grader would say, are you crazy? We even have Supreme Court justices. What's the definition of a female? I'm not a biologist. Well, you're a fool. And you start tracing every element of our, of our society. The devil is attacking family. He's breaking families apart. You look at all the incredible stuff, and I don't want to get sidetracked, but the kinds of entertainment that is being pawned off as you know, Disney friendly and all. There's so much occult and spiritualism and Satanism and satanic stuff in it. And these kids are swallowing this subtly. I didn't, I didn't intend to get sidetracked, but I did. But you see, the marriage and the family is one of the gifts that God gave mankind in the garden at creation. And the second is the Sabbath. And both of those I see being under such vicious attack. So for our own sake, for our own good, we need to lay aside all of our crazy pursuits for the just one special day, hang out with Jesus. See, God not only desires our spiritual health, but he also wants our physical health. He wants our mental health. And as we take time to spend with, with Jesus, it all fills itself out. Much of the world, you see, is on a treadmill that leads to an early grave. And God knew, hey, I needed that mankind. I, I, they need, need some time to rest. And that's what the Sabbath is all about. So you, get, you, know, I, you look around you, people, going madly, working seven days a week. To do what? Just to accumulate stuff. We talked about that the other night. Stuff that goes in the used storage facility because you don't have enough room at home to keep it. So you have to put it in a visit, you know, you can go visit it all you want. You can bring it home, but you gotta put some. So we work, work, work. To achieve and acquire stuff that maybe really isn't for our good. So God calls us to take a 24-hour break each week to rest in him, in him and with him. Not just an hour, you know, to attend church. But he says, we need some quality time together. Ezekiel 20, moreover, I gave them my Sabbath as a sign between me and them that they might know that I'm the Lord who sanctifies them. Who sets them aside. You see that? So the Sabbath is a sign of Christ's power to make us holy. Now listen to some of the promises given to those who in obedience seek the Sabbath blessing. Let's look at Isaiah 58. If you turn back your foot 
from the Sabbath, from doing your own pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. Excuse me, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. You get the picture? So God longs for us to have this relational time with him and to bless us. And the uh, Apostle John saw, he was in vision on the Lord's Day. We don't have to wonder what the Lord's Day is. We read in Mark 22, So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Wherefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Reading on. There's some questions that come up many, many times when you're talking about the Sabbath. One of those questions is, well, is the Sabbath relevant today? And how does it apply to me? Well, let me try to do this as quickly and as smoothly as possible. Friends, the Sabbath has never been more relevant than it is at this time in earth's history. It has never been more relevant to spend this holy time, this sanctified and blessed day each week, for us to grow our relationship with him. There has never been a more relevant time to demonstrate our love to him by obeying his commandments. Now, considering the belief of of evolution in our secular society, there's never been a more relevant time to honor and worship God as creator. There's never been a time more important, relevant than today to rest from the stresses of this crazy life than now. Never been more relevant time to spend this day with him and our families. I'd love to roll back the clock. In our home, Sabbath was just a special time. We knew we had our kids together. We do all kinds of fun things together with them. That's what God had intended. Another question, though, that's often asked is, so how do we keep the Sabbath to experience the blessings of the Sabbath? It's a good question. The Sabbath, friends, is an extra special time for, for renewing and building a relationship with our Creator. To honor God's day, we need to know when it is. Now, just pushing a pause button here. Sabbath keepers typically keep the Sabbath from sundown to sundown. That's the way they kept ta time in the Jewish Hebrew calendar. And for many, that's what they practice today. The reality is, is that when a person comes to the point where they realize, I'm going to set this time apart. You know, it's not like, you. well, let's see, sundown is at 623. Well, 622, I better get it. That's not the attitude of Sabbath observance that God wants. He wants us to be thinking about our experience with him during the week. So the first step in gaining the blessing is to disconnect from our secular work and all those activities to, to put that aside. I mean, this helps us to remove the distractions and to give time for more important matters. Yes, I hope all of us take time with our Lord every day, but the Sabbath is that special time where we don't have to experience the distractions of work or the worldly entertainment. And it binds our hearts to him in a very special way. By taking time with, with him uh, on the Sabbath is a huge blessing for families. Sabbath and the family were instituted in the Garden of Eden. And in God's purpose, 
They are beautifully linked together. The Sabbath provides opportunity for communion with God, with nature, with one another. We can look to Christ's example of how he, what he did on the Sabbath. How did he spend his Sabbaths? For ways of being a blessing to others on the Sabbath. Matthew 12. It's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. We don't have to take a lot of time tonight, but you know, you know that uh, miracle that we talked about the other night? Jesus does this healing on the Sabbath, and the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they accuse him you know, of, of breaking the Sabbath. Well, Christ's example, he unselfishly gave of his time to minister to the physical and the spiritual needs of others on the Sabbath as well as other days of the week. And all of us here tonight, we would be greatly blessed to follow that example in reaching out to the needs of others in our community, those that are less fortunate. Sabbath is, is that day to, to, and I'm going to just put a pause button here, where the enemy has done a ringer. One of the most joyful things for Sabbath is fellowship, is corporate worship with brothers and sisters in Christ, fellow believers. I'm a hugger. I'm, I, I, There's a couple of years where the old enemy thought he was going to take care of us. Being together in God's house as brothers and sisters, encouraging one another, praying with one another. That's one of the incredible blessings of the Sabbath that, that I just enjoy so much. But did you also know that we will be keeping Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath holy, throughout eternity in the new earth? Isaiah 66. For as the new heavens and the new earth, he's describing now, this is after this old world has been destroyed. We have a new heaven, a new earth. This is up in his kingdom. That I make that the new heaven and earth that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord. So shall your offspring and your name remain. From new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. So there it is. These are the words of Jesus himself. We've read it several times. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Friends, the reality is we obey, even when sometimes it doesn't make sense. Will we do it because he said so and trust him that it is good for that it's for our good? This was the test that Adam and Eve, they failed in the garden. You see, they trusted themselves instead of God. But it was a test that Abraham passed. And you remember that story of Abraham when he was to sacrifice his only son, who was to be the father of all nations. But Abraham passed that test when God asked him to do something that didn't make any sense. It made no sense to him at all. Obedience to God is the ultimate test. But here's the interesting dichotomy. Nine of the Ten Commandments are held dearly in every Christian denomination. I mean, go through them. But the minute the Fourth Commandment is mentioned, then the word legalistic enters the picture. Oh, the law was nailed to the cross. We're saved by grace. Not by works. Okay, so that gives me freedom now to go kill and commit adultery and steal and, and lie and cheat. Of course not. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So it now becomes a motive rather than a requirement, which is important. I keep 
the commandments because I love Jesus. Probably one of the greatest illustrations that I've heard in my, and this, I heard this illustration just after I'd graduated from college. If you ever have a chance to get any of Morris Venden's books on righteousness by faith, it changed my life. But he makes such a great illustration, and I'm going to share it with you tonight. Think of this. Do they have apple orchards up here? This elevation? Okay. Does an apple tree produce good apples because it's an apple tree? Or does an apple tree produce good apples to prove that it's an apple tree? Do I need to repeat the question? It's just a natural... It's just a natural result of the fact that it's an apple tree. It has nothing to prove. Friends, that's exactly the way it is with people who fall in love with Jesus. Does a born-again Christian, does he do all these good deeds and keep the commandments because he's a follower of Jesus Christ? Or does he do it to prove to someone that he's a Christian and a follower of Jesus? No, this is what happens when God gives us a new heart. There's no works involved. Not at all. You see, the changes happen without us even noticing it. This is what happens when we invite the invitation of the indwelling spirit that changes us. Notice these encouraging words by the psalmist. He pleads with the Lord, Lord, create in me a clean heart and do what? And renew a right spirit, a steadfast spirit within me. The Apostle Paul, he says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Did Paul have anything to do with everything becoming new? How did that happen? It's a natural result of the spirit dwelling within. And so all of a sudden now, my life, the good fruit, is a natural outpouring of the fact that God has changed us inside. Behold, all things become new. Following Christ... This is not an act of works on our parts, friends. It is the way in which the Spirit changes us so that we follow Him willingly. Not only willingly, but we do it with a joyful and a thankful heart. So we find in Romans 6, 14, where Paul states that we're no longer under law as a means of salvation. He's making it very clear that you can never work your way into heaven. Salvation comes totally and always by grace. You say, well, that kind of then defeats what you're just talking about. Oh, let's continue. For by grace are you saved through faith, the not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, but not of works, lest anyone should boast. Most major religions of the world are works oriented. I'll give you an example. Hinduism. All right? You got to be reincarnated and if you are if you've been good in whatever form of life you are, you're going to you're going to climb up that ladder and apparently there's what 10,000 different layers of, of of life in that system, but everything is works oriented. You look at Buddhism, Hinduism, Shinto, all the major religions of the world. And I'm going to point to a religion that we haven't had a chance to talk much about. But when you require people to kneel on, on a step and climb up steps, and, and every step you have to say a prayer, and you have to say this ritual, and, and, and you beat yourself with, with, with a, a whip or you cut your wrists, 
and, and you flog yourself as a way of trying to get God's favor to appease him, that's works. And that's not the way salvation happens. So, the question then comes back, why do we keep the commandments? Praise God, it's a direct result of the spirit that changes us from within. We can't do it. And I love the, the quote from Paul's letter in the church in Philippi who shares these encouraging words. He's saying, friend, brother, sister, he who began a good work in you will complete it the, until the day of Jesus Christ. That's when he returns. I share that with you because so many of us can look at ourselves and say, man, I got such a long way to go. I mean, there's so much ugliness in my life. Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm not worthy. You know what the beauty of this passage is? Our prayer needs to be that we say, God, I give you permission to complete that work in me. And not only that, but I'm praying for my grandchildren. And I'm praying for my son, and I'm praying for my daughter, and I'm praying for all those people that I love. I, I want to give you permission to do that. And we're getting into another whole area of God, the character of God. God never forces his will on anyone. And so the enemy, when you pray for someone, intercessory prayer, and you say, Lord, then God can look the enemy in the face I have permission to be here, thank you very much. And I'm here to change this person's life because I've been given an invitation. Oh. You see, this, is, this whole verse describes the process of a lifetime, and we, can, we don't have time to talk about justification and sanctification. Those are just big, big words. But you have to understand that it just doesn't happen overnight. It's a lifetime journey. So as we... As we close tonight, God, you told me to keep the Sabbath, to keep it holy. You wrote it on tables of stone at Mount Sinai. In your written word, you've said that if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Throughout Earth's history, you have always had faithful followers who've kept the Sabbath. I don't have time to talk about it tonight, but a lot of, a lot of people have a false understanding that Sunday worship came several hundred years into the Christian church, into the, into the early church. After the crucifixion Sabbath, after, after the resurrection, Seventh-day Sabbath was kept for hundreds of years. But if you want some interesting information on the change of the Sabbath. We have a, a book back there that I think the pastor has a, a couple of extra copies. We don't have time to talk about tonight. But there have always been God's faithful who have understood the importance of the Ten Commandments. One of the places that I was hoping to visit, I, I would love to visit the caves of the Waldensians these are a group of people that the church was torturing them because they took the little word of the Bible, God's word. But they hid in caves and they were faithful and true to God. Faithful followers who have kept his word. God, you kept through your son Jesus. When, you're, when your son Jesus was here on earth, he kept the Sabbath when he was here on this earth. Your disciples kept it holy after your death, in obedience to, to your request. You warned us in your word not to follow traditions of man. Prophet Isaiah told us, we read that earlier, that we'll be keeping the Sabbath throughout eternity in heaven. Lord, the reality is, as we sit here tonight, 
I just hope and pray that we all can come to realization that it can be our greatest joy to spend this special day to honor God as our creator, not only our creator, but our recreator. Because he recreates, he does, he does heart surgery, he does soul surgery on us, and as our redeemer. And this is the way we'll be worshiping, we'll be honoring God throughout eternity on the Sabbath. When Christ returns, the reality is this. We're going to hear one of two messages. Either he's going to say, Jody, depart from me. I never knew you. That whole passage there is about people who think they're following Jesus but they've never established a really relationship with him. And even though they've done all these good things, he says to them, I never, I never knew you. Done all these good things in your name. Either that, or I'll hear the words, Jody, you loved me. You kept my commandments, even though you may not have always understood. And these are the words I want to hear. And then the Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You're faithful over a few things. I'll make you rule over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Those are the words that Jody wants to hear more than anything. Basically, the Lord is saying, Welcome home, my child. Welcome home. I don't know who wrote the song, but I wish I could sing it. I thought I had it. Welcome home, children. This is the place I've prepared for you. Welcome home, children. You who have followed so faithfully. Friends, what will be your response when your time comes? I just wonder if you'd be willing to stand with me tonight and say, Lord, I want to do your will in my life, even though I may not understand everything. But I want to be faithful to you, and I want to be faithful to your word. Give me the courage. Give me the strength to do that. No matter what it is, yes, I see the importance of your Sabbath. And Lord, give me the strength to follow you to the very end. There's no greater joy than knowing that every one of us are totally surrender to God and be obedient to his word and to think about spending eternity with him. He loves us all and he wants us more than anything. He, he wants to hang out with us. And that quality time that he can hang out with us is especially designed on the Sabbath. Father, right now, I know that there are a lot of questions. Many times we, we realize that tradition and the way we've always done things in the past, it's just a natural byproduct of our culture. But Lord, we've seen tonight that the Sabbath is a very important part of your character. That it's a time you want to spend with your people that we will have an intentional time away from the craziness of this world to just hang out with you. Lord, I don't know what the heavenly choir is going to sound like, but I have a feeling that on the Sabbath in heaven, it's going to be an amazing experience. And you've told us that we're going to be celebrating the Sabbath throughout eternity. So, Lord, I guess I just want to encourage all of these wonderful people here tonight. Hey, let's get used to it now. Let's start a, let's start a habit now. It's never too late to start. Lord, you know every person's heart here. You know our desire to know you, to walk with you, to be called one of your sons or your daughters to be a part of your family. 
Lord, just continue to give us the strength to stand for what is right. To stand for right though the heavens fall. Lord, we want to be faithful to you. So as we leave this place tonight, Father, we again just want to say thank you for your word. We want to be faithful to you, Lord. And until you come, whatever it takes, we want you to change us. Make us more like Jesus so that the world around us would know they have something special and they want to know about him too. For your love, for health, for protection, for care, for safety, for all the good things we have, we just want to say a big thank you tonight. In your name we pray. Amen.